Welcome to the Folktale Project. This is Dan Scholes. Today we have Chapter 17 of B, the Princess of the Dwarves. Last we left off, King Locke, the King of the Dwarves, had witnessed everything that had happened to George of the White Moor, and, well, he had a decision to make. And today we're going to see what that decision wrought. This is chapter 17, in which King Locke makes a terrible journey. On leaving the Well of Science, King Locke went to his treasure, took a ring from a box of which he alone had a key, and put it on his finger. The bezel of this ring shone brightly, for it was made of magic stone, whose virtues will be discovered in the course of this story. King Locke then went to his palace, where he put on a traveling cloak, drew on heavy boots, and took a stick. Then he set out through the crowded street, the broad roads, the villages, and the halls of porphyry, the lakes of petroleum, and the grottoes of crystal, which communicated with each other by narrow openings. He seemed pensive and spoke words which had no sense, but he walked on steadily. Mountains blocked the way, and he climbed the mountains. Cliffs yawned at his feet, and he went down the cliffs. He crossed fords, he passed through grisly regions darkened by the fumes of sulfur. He walked over burning lava in which his feet printed themselves. He seemed to be an extremely determined traveler. He entered dark caverns where the sea water, trickling in drops, fell like tears along the weeds and made pools in the uneven soil in which innumerable crustaceans grew monstrously. Enormous crabs, giant crayfish, spiders of the sea cracked under the feet of the dwarf and made off, leaving behind a claw and waking in their hideous flight hoary little cuttlefish, who suddenly waved their hundred arms and spat from their beaks a reeking poison. King Locke went on all the same. He reached the end of these caverns, staggering under a load of monsters armed with stings, double-jagged pinchers, claws that curled up to his neck and sullen eyes brandished at the end of long branches. He climbed the side of the cavern, clinging to the roughness of the rock, and the armored beasts went up with him, and he only stopped when, by groping, he found a stone that jutted out of the vaulted summit. With his magic ring he touched this stone, which immediately fell with a great crash and immediately a flood of light poured its lovely streams into the cavern and put to flight the beasts bred in darkness. King Locke put his head through the opening where the light came from and saw George of the White Moor, thinking of Bee and the earth and mourning in his glass prison. For King Locke had made this subterranean journey to release the prisoner of the Sliffs. But seeing this big head, all hair, eyebrows, and beard look at him from the bottom of the crystal funnel, George thought that a great danger threatened him, and he felt for the sword at his side, forgetting he had broken it on the bosom of the green-eyed woman. Meanwhile, King Locke examined him curiously. Poof, he said to himself. It's only a child. Certainly it was a very simple child, and he owed to his great simplicity his escape from the delicious immortal kisses of the Queen of the Sliffs. Aristotle, with all his learning, could not have got out of it so easily. George, seeing himself defenseless, said, What do you want of me, big head? Why hurt me if I've never hurt you? King Locke answered in a jovial and gruff tone, My dear boy, you do not know if you have hurt me, for you are ignorant of effect and cause, of reflex action, and generally of all philosophy. But do not let us talk of this. If you are not reluctant to leave your funnel, come through here. George immediately insinuated himself into the cavern, slid down the wall, and... As soon as he reached the bottom, you're a good little man, he said to his deliverer. I will like you all my life, but do you know where Bee of the Clarities is? I know a great many things, answered the dwarf, and especially that I do not like inquisitive people. George, hearing these words, remained quite abashed, and he silently followed his guide through the thick and murky air where cuttlefish and crabs were moving. Then King Locke said to him with a grin, The road is rather rough, my young prince. Sir, George answered him. The way to freedom is always pleasant, and I'm not afraid of being lost by following my benefactor. Little King Locke bit his lips. When he reached the Hall of Porphyry, he showed the young man a staircase made in the stone by which the dwarfs go up above ground. Here's your road, 
he said to him. Goodbye. Do not say goodbye, replied George. Tell me you will see me again. My life belongs to you after what you have done for me. King Lark answered, What I have done was not for you, but for another. We had better not see each other again, because we might not like each other. George replied unaffectedly and seriously, I did not think that my release would give me pain, and yet it has. Goodbye, sir. I wish you a good journey, King Locke cried roughly. Now this staircase ended in a lonely quarry which lay less than a league from the castle of the Clarities. King Locke pursued his way, muttering, This boy has neither the learning nor the wealth of the dwarfs. I do not really know why he is loved by B, unless it is that he is young, handsome, loyal, and bold. He returned to the town, laughing to himself like a man who has played a practical joke on someone. Passing in front of B's house, he pushed his big head through the window as he had done into the glass funnel, and he saw the young girl embroidering a veil with silver flowers. Rejoice, B, he said to her. And you, she answered. Little King Luck, may you never have anything to wish for, or at least anything to regret. There was something he wished for, but really he had nothing to regret. This thought gave him a large appetite for supper. After eating a great number of truffled pheasants, he called to Bob. Bob, he says to him, get on your crow. Go to the princess of the dwarfs and tell her that George of the White Moor, who was for a long time a prisoner of the Slips, returned today to the Clarities. He spoke, and Bob flew off on his crow. And that is chapter 17, where King Locke makes a terrible journey and releases George of the White Moor from his prison of the Slits. We see that he's done it for B, but she doesn't know that he has done it for her. And it's it's an interesting move by the King of the Dwarves. I can't wait to see what it will bring about. This is Dan Schultz for the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com where you'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. As always, thank you so much for listening.